Well, good afternoon. God's peace. Welcome to this uh, discussion. Two discussions we'll have today. Uh, the first one is on uh, the sacrament of holy baptism, and so we'll try to address some of the questions that very often arise when it comes to that subject. Um, and then the second topic will be on the importance and the importance of the Holy Scriptures and how best to approach reading them, incorporating them into our lives in a way that perhaps we haven't done in the past. I think none of us would disagree about the importance of, of reading the Scriptures, but I think sometimes we take it for granted. Uh, we don't often read it as much as we ought to, and we don't often meditate it upon it as much as we ought to either. And that poses a problem for us, and we'll talk about that as well. But We'll start off with the, the first subject, and that's on baptism. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to fellowship with you. Um, also nice that we have the, you know, with a controversial topic sometimes, it's nice to have this distance. You won't be able to hit me with anything that you want on a throw. So this is good, um, and I have a little room to dodge if I have to. Um, but no, I understand this is sometimes uh, a controversial subject, and so I think it's important for us as Christians, when it comes to almost any topic, to be able to sit down and talk about things without necessarily, not necessarily giving in to someone else's opinion or perspective, but to actually even disagree in love with one another, to discuss these things, and if I don't agree with you and you don't agree with me, we can still part as brothers and sisters in Christ. I think that's an important thing for us to be able to do. Um, I, I uh, always appreciate that. I, I mean, I've run, against, run up against some people who are dead set against something I've said or something that I've taught, and we sit down and talk about it, and at the end, we might still disagree, but at least we still walk away uh, as brethren. Um, and I think that's very important. And I think it only makes us better as Christians, better in terms of how we approach the scriptures and how we get along with one another on something that's so important. Because when we're s discussing matters of the, of the word, is there really anything more important than discussing matters of the word? And I don't think there is. And so we should be able to do this in a cordial way. Um, and so when I say it, you know, I'm glad that you can't hit me from where you are, uh, I do say that in jest. Um, but nevertheless, there will be some times that we might have a disagreement, and that's okay. So don't feel free to, or I want you to feel free to, to voice uh, any questions that you might have, any disagreements that you might have. That's perfectly fine. So what we're going to do is we'll go through the presentation, and then we'll leave time at the end for some questions. And so please feel free uh, to share those questions. If we, in the course of going along with this, if you have a question that you want to ask at the moment, that's fine. This isn't intended to be a sermon, so you can interrupt. That's, that's perfectly fine. I'm okay with that as well. Sometimes we, if we save our questions to the end, then we forgot the question that we were going to ask. So if it strikes you at the moment and you want to raise your hand and call attention to it, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, so with that, L why don't we begin our session in the word of, in the word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship together under the hearing of your word. And as we discuss matters of faith, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that you would lead us and guide us by that Spirit in accordance with your word. For Father, without your Spirit, we cannot know you and we cannot understand the Scriptures. We must have your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. And so, Father, we ask that you would do so, and we know that you desire to do so. And we ask that you would do so to the honor and glory of Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the, uh, you have two handouts that I've given you. One is on the sacrament of holy baptism, and the other one is on infant baptism. We're going to talk about the first one, uh, the sacrament of holy baptism, first. And so I'll read the introduction, then I'm going to say a few words about um, baptism in general, and then we'll go through the rest of the presentation. The sacrament of holy baptism has been studied and discussed within the Christian church since its beginning. 
and the meaning and importance of baptism is still debated in Christian circles today. Our apostolic Lutheran tradition is no exception. While it would be unrealistic to expect that we could come to unanimous con consensus on every aspect of baptism, it is our hope and prayer that our discussion today would be just the beginning of a dialogue that explores the richness of what God has given us in the sacrament of baptism. The focus on this presentation will be primarily on what God reveals to us through his holy word, by the leading of the Holy Spirit. We have all come to our own understanding concerning baptism from various preachers and teachers. We can gain further insight through the writings of Lestadius, Luther, Augustine, and so on. However, the final authority in all matters of faith must remain the Holy Scriptures. It is perfectly acceptable to refer to the teachings of faithful preachers of the past, but they must all answer to the Word of God. And so that's really the, the foundation of what we're going to talk about. Now, I'm certainly not saying that I'm afraid of quoting Luther or anything like that. That's not the point here. But really, the sole authority on all these matters is the Word of God. And so you might hear me talk about the Lutheran understanding of baptism. But when I talk about it, I want to, to be sure about how we define that. Because when we call something Lutheran, or at least when I refer to something as Lutheran, all I'm saying is not that I'm fo a follower of Luther. Because even Luther would have shuddered at the thought of referring to ourselves as Lutheran. You know, because Luther never set, apart, set out to, to start a new denomination. He always wanted to reform the church as it was. And even the term Lutheran was not used in a positive sense, as in, well, we're all Lutherans. We were called Lutherans. <laughs> you know, the reformers were referred to as Lutherans in a derogatory manner. And that, if that sounds familiar, that's actually how Christians were referred to in the beginning of the church. It wasn't that we called ourselves Christian. It's that, it's that the outside world referred to us as Christians because we were followers of Christ. And so we don't hide from that because we are followers of Christ. Now, when I say Lutheran, all I'm saying is that we follow Luther insofar as he followed Christ. Luther had one primary focus when it came to approaching matters of faith, and that's what was referred to as sola scriptura. In other words, the scripture alone. Luther famously said, I would rather that you burn all of my writings than simply read the Word of God. But people didn't have access to the Word of God back then like they do today, like we do today. And so that's why Luther wrote his catechism. That's why he translated the New Testament into German, because many of the German people did not know Latin, and that's what the Mass was usually recited in. You would go to the worship service, the priest would do the liturgy in Latin, and then he would preach in Latin, and so people <laughs> had no clue what he was saying. Luther translated into German, so people could read German. They could read it in their own tongue. He, in essence, gave them the scriptures, because they didn't have access to them otherwise. But Luther would always steadfastly point to the scriptures as the sole authority. This is why he got in trouble with Rome, because Rome insisted that the church mattered. What the church said was just as important as what the scriptures said, that we must have both. And so what the popes said, what, what the church fathers said, was equally on the same level as the scriptures. And Luther said, no, it's the scripture that must remain the final authority. And so that's what we're talking about. And furthermore, the other part of this that's really kind of important is that when we read the scriptures, we'll talk about this in the second seminar as well, when we try to derive meaning from the word of God, the first and foremost focus must be on what the scripture says. Now that sounds obvious, right? But when you think about communication, we communicate with one another in a variety of ways. If I'm speaking to you personally, um, you hear the words that I say, but you also hear the vocal intonation that I give. So if I'm saying it in a 
joking way, you understand that. If I say it in a forceful way, you understand that. If I say it in a quiet way, you hear something a little bit different. You might also watch my facial expressions as I speak to you, and you learn something from that as well. You might also watch hand gestures, and that tells you something as well. All of those things are communicating something between us. But with the scripture, we only have one thing. We have the word printed on the page. That's all we have. And you might think, well, it's obvious then that we just read what it says and we just trust what it says. But I would submit that many times we do read what the Bible says and we don't believe it. In fact, our mind just kind of automatically says, well, that would be nice if it were true, but I don't really believe it. And I'll give you an example of that. In, first, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, what did that just say? Every. God has blessed you with how many blessings? Every blessing. Does he have any blessings that he's holding back? Well, what does every mean? Yeah, it means every blessing. He has no other blessing to give you other than what he has given you in Christ. He's given you everything he can give you. Now, do you feel like you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ? Do you always feel that way? Well, I don't. I don't feel like, sometimes I feel like I'm lacking a lot of things. But the question is, who am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to my feelings, or am I going to listen to what the Word of God says? Because if God says, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, and I feel as if I'm not, who's wrong? I'm wrong. Now, you might want to remember that phrase because I don't admit that I'm wrong that often. Um, but that's the bottom line. If the scripture says something and I feel something different, I'm wrong. And the same thing is true with reason. For example, again in Ephesians, this time in chapter 2, Paul says, you are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. So where are you seated right now? Do you believe that? No, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I love coming to this place. This is a great fellowship, Paul. But this isn't exactly what I had in mind when I picture heaven. You know? When you're sitting here, it's a wonderful place. I've had many tremendous meals here. Uh, but my mind tells me right now I'm not seated in the heavenly place. Of course, I'm standing. But even when I'm sitting here, it doesn't. my mind tells me I'm not seated in the heavenly places. I'm seated right here. But the Bible tells me I'm seated in the heavenlies with Christ. So which do you believe? Do you trust your mind or do you trust the word of God? And of course, I would suggest, I would submit that we always, before anything else, trust the word of God. What does the word say? And so, that co poses a dilemma for us because sometimes we read things in the scripture and we say, well, I don't like what that says. And so is there some way of deriving a different meaning other than what it says? And that's what gets us into trouble. And I would suggest that as Luther pointed out, that we rely only on the scripture in matters of faith. And in doing so, we rely upon what the word of God says. Now, before we get into the rest of this particular subject, um, I want to talk about the word baptism, first of all. Um, before we get into the discussion of baptism, what does the word mean? You've heard that word used many times before, but what does it actually mean? Anybody know? 
You might have heard this before. I suspect your pastor might have said this before. Yeah, be joined to. Introduction, you've heard that definition. Yeah, sometimes we talk about it as, a, as an initiation rite. The actual, the actual literal definition of the word comes from the Greek word bat, baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. And for a couple examples of this, the same, there's another root word that's called bapto. That's a Greek root word. And so, like, if you remember, uh, when Jesus is instituting the Last Supper with his disciples, he talks about dipping the sop. You remember that? And that word for dipping is bapto. Now, he's not saying he's baptizing the sop, but he's dipping the sop into the, into the wine. And that's really where that root comes from. And so when we talk about baptism, we're talking about a dipping. And another example of this, and this is what was present in the ancient world. In the ancient world, they would baptize fabrics. Well, what does that mean? Well, they would baptize them in a dye. And so they would put this fabric in a dye, and when it comes out, is it, does it look the same as it, when it went in? it? No. The dye fixes itself to the fabric, and so now the fabric comes out totally changed. That was called baptizing fabric, baptizing them in a dye. And so sometimes we think of baptism as a washing. You know, that's kind of maybe more what we've been raised with, even with the catechism and that sort of thing, the washing of regeneration, as Luther referred to it in the catechism. But I would suggest that it's even more than just washing. This is a union. There is a dipping that takes place. There is an immersion that takes place. And we're not talking about the mode of baptism by any means. We're just talking about what actually is happening in baptism itself. And we'll get into that a little bit more uh, when we actually talk about baptism itself. And Furthermore, one of the things that we need to ask, and we'll answer this question a little bit later, is why was Jesus baptized? I'm going to leave that question out there. You can think about that as we go, and we'll come to back to it later. But the word bap baptize, or baptism, comes from the root word baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. And I'm going to suggest that the better way of looking at that word baptism is to be united with, to be joined to. And we'll discuss this in a little bit. But one of the things that gets controversial about baptism is because we think, we think a certain way. We've heard certain things about baptism, and especially with regards to the means of grace, it's a means of grace, that it has the power or capacity to save. But before we get into any of that, Let's stop and ask the question first of all. Who is it that saves us? Yes, it is God in Christ who saves us. And so to begin this presentation, it will be most helpful to start with the basics. So instead of asking the question, what saves us from sin, we are better served by asking the question, first asking the question, who saves us from sin? There's probably a little disagreement in our fellowship that God and God alone is the one who gives salvation to sinful mankind. The Apostle Paul is clear. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. God has atoned for our sins by the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. The merits of Christ through his life, suffering, his death, and his resurrection are sufficient to redeem all of mankind. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, 
even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men unto condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall, me, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. So Paul makes it very clear. Who is it that saved us? Jesus the Christ. That's no big surprise, right? Nobody's surprised by this. In fact, it's so am amazing because I love this passage out of Romans because Paul compares the sin of Adam and the effect of that sin with the work of Christ. And in chapter 5, and you can read this for yourself, when you read chapter 5 in Romans, you'll see five times in there the Apostle Paul uses the phrase much more. In other words, whatever happened with Adam, the benefits of Christ are much greater, much more. Much more, much more, much more, much more. Which is a great comfort because, you know, sometimes, of course, we're laden with sin and, of course, we feel like my sin is so great, there's no way God can, God can save me. But the grace of God is much more, much more, much greater than your sin. The hymn writer is right. Grace greater than our sin. The devil comes in and he says, no, no, I think God's running out of, your, of grace for you. No, he doesn't. It's not even close. So we should never despair to that end. The grace of God is much greater than our sin. John also kind of echoes a similar thought with regard to who saves us. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. This is a passage that was, if it sounds a little bit familiar, it's right after what our brother spoke about last night in 1 John chapter 1. John talks about this in, the, in, first chapter one, in chapter 1, talks about the importance of confession. That if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But in the beginning of chapter 2, I love this because the Apostle John says, I write these things to you so that you sin not. But if any man does sin, and I like that because, of course, I like the fact that he uses if. He gives us this great benefit of the doubt. If you do by chance sin, and of course we will sin. But John is charitable. He says, well, if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We have a defender. We have someone who stands in the presence of God and intercedes on our behalf. And he intercedes not merely with words, but with his own blood. We, we can have no greater defender. And he is the propitiation. That word, I don't know if you know what that word means, but propitiation simply means a payment to set aside wrath. In other words, the sacrifice of Christ was a payment to set aside God's wrath. So he does not visit his wrath upon you. He's already poured it out on his son Jesus at the cross. 
So, like I say, this is pretty easy. I don't think there's anyone here that disagrees that Christ is the one who saves us. That God in Christ is the one who saves us. But then how does God save us? Well, the Holy Scriptures teach us that God is the author of salvation for the human race, sure, surely by his mercy and grace shown us in Christ. However, the question remains, how does grace come to us? Once again, there are probably very few who would disagree with the Apostle Paul that God's saving grace comes to us by faith. That's kind of one of the hallmarks of not only Lutheranism, but apostolic Lutheranism as well. In addition to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul emphasizes the importance of faith in many places in epistles, in his epistles. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So what is Paul saying? Well, he's saying that justification comes by faith. Well, what is justification? How would you define justification? Yeah, that's a very good definition. You know, sometimes we hear these words and it's like, yeah, how would I define that? <laughs> you know, but even in the word, it kind of gives you the hint. Righteousness means being right. So how can I become right before God? And so Paul juxtaposes these two things. Can we do it on the basis of the law? Well, we could if what happened? Yeah, if we could follow it perfectly. Then we could be justified by the law. So how many of you have done that? You kept the law perfectly. Yeah, none of us have done that. And that's what Paul says. He says, now there's a righteousness that comes apart from the law. And that's the righteousness that comes by faith. So, now because of faith in Christ Jesus, God sees us as righteous. Even though we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even though we fail and will fail, God still sees us and accounts us as righteous for the sake of his Son. Paul also talks about this in his letter to the Galatians. He says, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, Know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid! For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh, or I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then faith, and then Christ is dead in vain. 
So if any part of my righteousness, if I, if I claim any righteousness of my own, then what I'm saying to God is that I don't need Jesus. I don't need that, that Christ would have died. That's how strongly Paul words this. If you dare stand in your own righteousness, you are telling God, I don't need Christ in the cross. The letter to the Galatians is not an easy letter. He really goes after the Galatians because the Galatians, they basically heard the gospel and they decided, well, we're going to go back under the law too. And Paul says, no, don't do that. That's ridiculous. He says, you began well, but now you went back. It's like we try to perfect the work of God by doing things on our own. And the only thing we do when we do that is we mess it up. And so this is what he says. And that's Galatians 2, 15 through 21. Then also Philippians. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. That's Philippians 3, 7 through 10. Now, if you rem remember the beginning part of that chapter, the Apostle Paul talks about all the reasons why he could have confidence in his flesh. You know, he was a Pharisee, he was a Jew, he was born of the tribe of Benjamin, he was zealous as a Pharisee, he had everything working for him. And what does he end up saying? All of that stuff is dung compared to knowing Christ. Now, does it mean that none of that stuff mattered? No, of course it was good, but in comparison to Christ, it was next to nothing. It was dung. Is it, is it bad to be a Pharisee, someone who studies the law? No, it's not bad to do that. But if in the end you don't see Christ, well then yeah, this isn't good. And that's what Brother Scott was talking about last night. The Pharisees, they studied the law, but somehow didn't see God's Messiah when he was standing right in front of them. It's not the study that's the problem. It's that they wouldn't believe. The Spirit of God hadn't opened their eyes to see Jesus. And that was their problem. And then also John talks about this. In his gospel, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3 uh, 14 through 17. So then, God saves us by his grace, which we receive by the faith that he gives to us. So far, so good. Again, this is all pretty common ground. I think you could probably walk in almost any circle in, in any church and come to this same place. I mean, maybe the Roman Catholic Church would, would fight a little bit on the idea of the role of works but the scripture is pretty plain on this. You know, if we adhere to the scripture, you cannot escape the fact that the scripture tells us that we are justified by faith apart from works. There's no way of changing the meaning of that unless you change the text of the scripture. Then the next question. If we're saved by grace, if it's God who saves us, and he saves us by grace through faith, how does that faith come to us? 
as the Apostle Paul has already instructed us, faith is a gift of God. In the, uh, we heard that in Ephesians. In fact, Ro in Romans and Galatians, Paul refers to this saving faith as the faith of Christ. I want to pause for a second there because um, in most modern translations, you won't see that. If you read Romans 3 or if you read Galatians 2, they will change that to, to say faith in Christ. And you can kind of see why they say that because everybody has faith in something, we sh but our, we would say our faith is in Christ. But in both Romans and in Galatians, it says the faith of Christ. So it sounds a little bit different. And we might say, well, why does Christ need faith? Why would it say of the faith of Christ? Well, it doesn't say it because Christ somehow needed faith. Because he needed no faith. He's the Son of God. It says of Christ because faith is from God. It is from Christ himself. It is his to give. And so this is why the writer to the Hebrews refers to Jesus Christ as the author and finisher of our faith. And so in this case, you know, no matter what you feel about the King James Version of the Bible, the King James Version has this right. When it says the faith of Christ, that's exactly what it means. The Greek preposition for that term, you know, it, could be, it can be translated in, but almost always it's translated of. The, the preposition in Greek is ek. And almost always ek is translated as of. It's only on rare occasions where you have it translated as in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and that's why we say faith is a gift of God. Who is it that gives it to us? It is God. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. God is the giver of saving faith, and according to the Holy Scriptures, such, such faith comes to us but one way, hearing the word of God. I'm going to read that again. Such faith comes to us but one way, hearing the word of God. If you can find another place in the scripture where faith comes to us in any other way, please let me know because I haven't been able to find it. Romans 10 says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall, shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes. Verily, their sound, has went, ha, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Romans 10, 8 through 13. So, this is why coming to the hearing of God's word is so important. This is why we need to hear this not just once, but over and over again. Whenever you are weak in faith, what is the answer? Come to the hearing of God's word. Whenever you have doubts and fears, whenever you're struggling with anything, the answer is always the same place. Come to the word of God, hear what God says to you, and you will be strengthened in faith. It will happen. And so I, I, I so appreciate it. I mean, I don't know if... Scott could see me last night when, when he was preaching and he was talking about this passage out of Isaiah 55. I was almost nodding my head off. Because what he said was exactly the same thing that I tell my congregation. I've got that verse in the pulpit of our church. You know, 
Because if there's one thing that empowers me to stand up and preach, it's the promise of God that his word will not return unto him void. Because if I stand up and preach and it's dependent upon me, I'm going to quit. There's no way I'm doing this job if God doesn't promise to do the work. Because I know I will fail from time to time. But I also know that even if I don't say things exactly right, even if I don't preach a great sermon or whatever that might look like, God still will do the work. If I am faithful to delivering the word of God, God still will make, he will see to it, that his word does not return void. Otherwise, I'm, I'm hanging it up. Because it's just like Scott was sharing last night. We are just jars of clay. We're earthen vessels. That's why Paul talks about it as the foolishness of preaching. God has entrusted the greatest treasure, the message of the gospel, and he gave it to us. Now, to us, that would seem reckless. Why would you do that? Why would you let sinful human beings be instruments to share the greatest message? And yet, that's what he does. And for us, that looks like foolishness. And that's why Paul says it's the foolishness of preaching. The foolishness doesn't lie within the message. The foolishness lies within those who bring it forth. It looks foolish. But even as Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, he says the foolishness of God is wiser than men. When the, wor when the word of God is spoken, faith is affected in the hearts of those who, who hear it. I would also add to that, God works not only faith, but also what? When we hear the word of God. Very important aspect of Christian, our Christian life. Starts with R. Yeah, repentance. There is no repentance apart from the work of God through his word by the power of the Spirit. And yet when God speaks, what does he do? He brings us to repentance and he kindles faith in our hearts. That's also an important word to define. What does repentance mean? Well, literally it means to change your mind. When we're called to repent, we're called to change our mind. And we would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's, it's supposed to be a change of heart. Well, it means that too. But first and foremost, change your mind. Stop thinking about things the way you think about them. And that's what Jesus does. When he speaks to us, we're challenged by it. We don't like hearing some of the things that he says. And so it challenges us. And, and gradually it changes our mind. We're confronted by our sin and we don't like it. But we have to acknowledge that what God says is true. We are sinners. We are sinners to the core of our being. And the wages of sin is death. And that's what drives us to repentance. We change our minds. We see God as telling us the truth. That also then in turn changes our hearts to understand that sin does matter. And it also changes our behavior. Because repentance bears fruit. Repentance isn't simply saying, well, I'm sorry for what I did, and then continue to do it. We didn't teach our children that way, but somehow we kind of do it anyway, don't we? You know, we apologize, but then it's not long before we do the same thing. True repentance doesn't do that. Repentance is a change of mind, which leads to a change of heart, which leads to a change of behavior. A turning away from sin and turning to Christ who is the author of salvation. While those are, while those are words uh, who harden, while there are those who harden their heart to, to God's word, the fault does not lie with God. Isaiah, as Isaiah records, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the purpose which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent. 
Now, we'll introduce a subject here that's not really a specifically a scriptural thing, but it, it's reinforced by the scripture, and we'll talk about that actually in the second session. But this is something that we refer to in theological circles, or whatever that means, as performative utterance. When God's word is spoken, this is unlike any other word that's spoken. I could stand up here and, and recite to you Shakespeare. I, I don't know a lot of Shakespeare, but I know some. So I could stand up here and talk about Shakespeare, and you would be informed a little bit about Shakespeare, or else you'd be so bored that you would just take a nap. But if you wanted to listen, I could teach you something about Shakespeare. Better yet, maybe a better example is I was, used to be a science teacher. So I could stand up here and I could give you a science lecture. That would instruct you about something concerning science. But what does that make, what difference does that make to you? Does it change your life in any remarkable way? The word of God is different. That when God's word is spoken, it changes us. It does something to us. For example, when we say, like at the beginning of the church service, we begin with a prayer. Anybody know what that prayer is called? Starts with an I. Yeah, the invocation. That first opening prayer, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that's referred to as the invocation. And what we're doing in the invocation is we are invoking the presence of God. We are not only asking God to be present among us, but we are also acknowledging the fact that he is. That as that service begins, and we begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, everything that proceeds from that is in the presence of God. Furthermore, when the pastor stands up and he begins his message, he says, Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is referred to as the apostolic greeting. But this is also performative utterance. When he greets you with that message of grace, mercy, and peace, he is not simply saying, well, I hope you have grace, mercy, and peace. What is he doing? He's giving you grace, mercy, and peace. God, through his servant, is bestowing upon you grace, mercy, and peace. And the same thing is true with the benediction. When the pastor stands up and he delivers the benediction, he says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Is that just a hopeful suggestion? No. When he stands there and he says this, it's true. God is blessing you. God is bestowing his peace upon you. He is lifting his countenance upon you. That's what performative utterance is. In the same way as if the pastor stands up and he pronounces to you the forgiveness of your sins. Your sins are forgiven. As he says th those words to you from the word of God, does he have the power to forgive sins? Does the pastor have that power? in and of himself? No. But he does so by the authority of Christ. That's the office of the keys. He has given that authority to the church on earth to declare the forgiveness of sins. And so, as Luther says it in the Catechism, he says, you hear those words as if it were God himself that were speaking to you. Now, yeah, I know your pastor doesn't maybe look like what you would envision God to be, but he is the servant of God, and as he speaks to you, that's what he's doing. It is God speaking to you through that vessel. And so you can take that to the bank. Well, maybe not the bank. The bank isn't the most safe place anymore. But you can be assured that that's the case. Not because Pastor Dennis says it, or pa because Brother Scott says it, or because Pastor Chuck says it, 
but because God says so in his word. That's performative utterance. So, whenever the Holy Scriptures are heard, God works to, to bring the hearer to repentance and faith. This is true whatever way we hear God's word, and this is the key point, including the sacraments. God speaks to us in the proclamation of his word every time we hear a message proclaimed from the pulpit. God speaks to us in the words of absolution. When either in a public way or in a private way, we turn to someone and say, I need to hear that my sins are forgiven. And then maybe a brother or sister or maybe a pastor comes to you and says, believe your sins forgiven and washed away in the blood of Jesus. Can they believe that? Why should we believe what they say? Because they are speaking on behalf of God. That's why. They assure us with that forgiveness in the absolution. God speaks to us in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. This is my blood, given and shed for you for what? For the remission of your sins. So is there remission of sins in the sacrament? Well, if, again, we believe what the word says, then yes, absolutely there is. This is my blood, given and shed for you for the remission of your sins. And God speaks to us in the waters of holy baptism as well. And we'll get to that now shortly. Some of the disputes concerning baptism and the Lord's Supper stem from the misunderstanding that baptism and the Lord's Supper brings, bring God's grace to us in a different way. This is not the case. The sacraments are not magical. They do, they do not sim somehow confer God's grace to us by our outward act. God is the one who performs this act in his word. And this is what Luther speaks about in the Catechism. Martin Luther rightly observes in his Catechism that it is not the water indeed that does it, but it is the word of God which is in and with the water and faith which trusts this word of God in the water. Now I've heard this, you know, I had, a, I had this person come to a funeral one time and we were talking in the basement after the funeral service and, and they were from a different tradition and they told me, they said, well, so you're a Lutheran? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, so you believe that baptism does something? And I said, well, yeah. I said, well, I believe it because God's word says it. And he says, well, then why don't you just stand on the street and hose people down as they drive by? And again, this is kind of this kind of belies the misunderstanding of the sacrament. Yeah, I could sit down and hose people down as they go by the street, but it's not the water. But that's the way people think of this stuff. And even when we see the outward act happen, whether it be in the home or in the, in the church setting, we need to understand that it's not the water that's doing this. The water is a sign. This is the outward sign. What does something is the word. That's why even the reformers, when they talk about the sacraments, they end up saying, you know, when we talk about the number of sacraments, really, we can boil it down to one. There's one sacrament, and that's the sacrament of the word. So if you have the word, you also have a sacrament. Now, sacrament, you know, it depends on how you define it, but a sacrament is usually defined as an external or a physical sign of God's invisible grace. Can I see grace? Well, no, but can I see a baptism? Yeah, I can see that. Can I see grace in the supper? No, I can't see it, but I can see the sign. I can taste it when the wafer is put on my mouth when I drink of the cup. 
So the key thing here is God is not doing something radically new or different. The blessings of his son, Jesus Christ, still come to us by the hearing of his word and are received by faith. Separated from God's word, which speaks to us about the redemption purchased for us by the blood of Christ, baptism is simply water and nothing more. Luther says that as well in the Catechism. But again, it's not so much what Luther says about it. It always comes back to what does the Word of God say about it. So, what blessings come to us by way of baptism? And so we'll go through some of these as laid out in the Scriptures. Some of these are going to be similar to what you have in that second handout. And I don't know if we'll really have time to go through that second one. The second handout really talks about why we baptize infants. By what authority do we baptize infants? Um, but we'll, we'll get to that later. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The reason Christ commands us to baptize is because God has attached great blessings in holy baptism. Well, that kind of refers to the next thing. You know, why do we baptize? Because Christ commands us to. Now, I've heard people talk about this before. Well, we don't need baptism. Now, we need to be careful about this because, of course, is baptism the only way that God can bestow grace upon us? Well, no, we've already made that clear, right? Any way the word comes to us, any way faith comes to us by the hearing of the word, and so we would say baptism is necessary, but it's not absolutely necessary. Now that sounds like double speak, but it's not really. It's necessary because God commands it. How dare we turn around and tell God, well, I know you commanded it, but I don't need it. How can we do that? We can't do that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Let's come back to that, because we'll go through this. Well, yeah, because we're going through the blessings, so we'll come, we'll come to that. So, so first and foremost, we, we baptize because we're commanded to do so. But that's not the only reason we baptize, that we baptize. Because God has attached great blessings to it. So, what are those blessings? Well, first of all, the remission of sins. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is Acts 2, 37 through 39. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. So this is the first blessing. The second one is union with Christ. And, of course, this is what we've already talked about. In several passages of the Scripture, it is helpful for us to see baptism as a merging or a union. The word baptizo from which we, get, which we get the word baptize, literally means to merge or to immerse or to dip. In his own baptism, Jesus needs no washing. There is no sin that needs to be washed away. So then the question is, why was he baptized? If we say it's for remission of sins, well, that's ridiculous because he needed no sins to be remitted. If we say it was for righteousness, because even Jesus says that, right? When he comes to be baptized of John the Baptist, John says, no, 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 you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. And Jesus says what? Yes, suffer it to be so now to fulfill all righteousness. 
So what righteousness was Jesus like? Well, none. Was he lacking any righteousness? But now if we see this in light of the union, well, is he, who is he uniting with? Who needs righteousness? We do. So in the baptism of Christ, what does Christ do? He unites himself to the human race. This is why it was necessary. This is what the baptism of Jesus means. He came down to join himself to the human race in order to save it. He didn't need any righteousness. We did. He immerses himself in the human race in order to save it. Christ joins himself to humanity to fulfill all righteousness. And the passage is in Matthew 3. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And when Jesus was baptized, uh, and, when, and when he was baptized, went straightway up out of the water, and the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my belo beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And I think this is really significant, because as we reflect upon a baptism of an infant, or even perhaps the fact that we ourselves have been baptized, God views us in the same way. Because we are in Christ, those same words apply to us. You are his beloved child, and he is well pleased with you. Because of who you are? No. He is well pleased with you because you are in his son, Christ Jesus. Paul also spoke speaks about the union with Christ in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So before we move on from that, I just want you to look at this once again. Because remember we talked about a, a definition of baptism being like a merging or a union. But you notice what Paul does in, in verses 3 and 4. Because he uses those terms interchangeably. And if you think about it being united with, you could say, you, know ye not that th so many of us, as were united into Christ Jesus, were united into his death. Therefore, we are united or buried with him by, by this union unto death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead with, from the glory, or by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of death, of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. This is what God has done for us in Christ. He has joined, him, joined us to his son, and that's why we talk about this. We were joined into his death. We were brought into his death. 
The old Adam in us was crucified on the cross and buried. And it was done that way so that he could raise us to newness of life. That as Christ was raised from the dead, guess what? So are we. We walk in newness of life because when Christ went to the cross, we went with him as well. And as Christ was raised from the dead, so the human race was raised from the dead as well. So, then also, we put on Christ. This is Galatians chapter 3. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law that, uh, given, which could have given life, very, verily righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise of, by faith of, of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith, in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek, nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, again, you know, if someone were to say to you, well, why should we baptize? Why should we be baptized? Or why should we have our children baptized? Or why should anybody be baptized? Well, I would submit to you, maybe ask the question. Does it sound good to put on Christ? When Paul talks about it in, in Galatians, those of you who have been baptized have put on Christ. Does that sound like a good thing? Is that something that I want for myself or for my children? Well, I would say absolutely. I don't know how you would say otherwise. The only way you would say it is if you don't believe what the Word of God says. Now, we can say, well, that's not what it means. But then again, we have to come to grips. If you're going to say it doesn't mean that, then you have to come to grips with why do you say that? Because the text of the scripture says it. So you have to come up with another reason to say that the meaning is other than what the text says. So then, finally, salvation. Now this is getting closer to um, the question that was posed about new birth, but not quite. Um... This is in 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also hath su once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us unto God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is in eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto bap even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is, is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So, the Apostle Peter is talking about the fact that this is kind of, you can compare this to Noah. The ark preserved Noah. You know, when the flood came, we would look at the ark and we'd say, okay, hey, look at that. The ark saved Noah. Well, did it? Is that true? What's that? Okay, but they were saved from the water, right? But really to say that the ark saved Noah is incomplete, right? 
There's something more, right? God saved him. Yeah. I mean, it's true, God used the ark, but it was God who saved Noah. I mean, how would Noah have known to build an ark? How would God, how would Noah even know what an ark was? You know, much less what to do with it. It was God that told him. Now, you could say, well, Noah, to his credit, believed. I mean, it's kind of amazing when you think about it. You know, who, had they ever heard of a flood before? You know, and so when God tells him, build an ark, it's like, can you imagine the neighbors coming by and saying, what are you doing? Oh, I'm building an ark. There's a flood coming. I mean, and then, of course, he can't do this overnight either. He had to do this for a long time. And you can't tell me, well, I shouldn't say this. I have to think, even though this is total speculation, so you can disregard this if you want. Because the Bible doesn't say this, but you have to wonder, did Noah ever get up and say, what in the world am I doing? Why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, why am I doing this? But nevertheless, he did it. And so it's true that God used the ark to save Noah, but it was God who saved him. But then he uses this same idea with baptism. Baptism does save you. But it, does it save you by the outward act? Is it some magic ritual by, you know, we'll take a child there and all of a sudden they're saved. Boom. But if you notice here, and I'll look real closely here because this is where the text matters. He says, wherein baptism doth now also save us. And then there's that parenthetical phrase, that part that's bracketed there. This is kind of like a secondary thought, right? And so you have to kind of take that out, or at least you have to remember that this is just a secondary thought. If you took that out for a second, I'm not suggesting you remove it from your Bible, but just take it out for a second and then read it again. Even, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So does the act of baptism save you? No. It is the person behind baptism that saves you. It is Christ who saves you through the waters of baptism. See, part of the big problem with the, our discussion of baptism is that we get so fixed on the outward act. And we separate it entirely from the work of Christ. And we tend to think, well, if you're saying baptism says, saves, and I'm saying the cross saves, well, then we're talking about two different things. But we never say that the, that the act of baptism is separated from the cross. Never. Because it can't be. To separate baptism from the cross means you're separating baptism from Jesus. And we would never do that. When we baptize infants, or when we baptize anyone for that matter, we are, we are celebrating their union with Christ. That means their union with the same one who suffered, who died, and who rose again from the dead. So if you are united with Christ, is that a good place to be? <laughs> Absolutely. It is the best place to be. It is the only place to be. And this is the problem with our discussion of baptism because we stop short and we focus on the outward act instead of recognizing what's behind the act as well and the person who is behind the act. When, just like I told you before, when you hear your pastor speak and he's proclaiming to you the gospel, who really is speaking to you? God. 
when the baptism goes, when the baptism is taking place in the church and that pastor is sitting there baptizing the child, who is really doing the baptism? God. And if we start looking at it in that way, then we begin to see really the proper understanding of baptism. Now, I'm going to read the conclusion, then we'll come back to the question, because I think we still need to address that question, although we kind of, in a certain way, did. In the ancient church, the sacraments were referred to as the mysteries because it is often difficult to comprehend why and certainly how God does the things that he does. It is generally believed that because we are physical beings, God gives us visible signs of his invisible grace in order to strengthen our faith and to assure us of the promises and declarations of his word. This presentation is not intended to be the final say on the subject of baptism, nor does it answer every question that we may have on the subject. The sacraments are mysteries, after all. This is really the way Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. It's the way the ancient church fathers talked about them. To say that today we're going to solve the mystery would be foolish. <laughs> and arrogant. It is our hope that we as a church would continue to seek out the truths of these matters in God's word together. As we commune together on these matters of faith, we will likely discover that we are not so far apart as we may think. We pray that God would continue to open his word to us, affirming that the things we already hold to be true and connecting or correcting the false notions that arise because of our limited understanding. May God pour out his Holy Spirit upon us to guide us into all truth. For the sake of Christ and in his name, amen. So, before we open it to other questions, let's talk about the one that just came up. Is there new birth and baptism? Okay, before we, a before we answer that question, let's just first of all ask, where, um, where does the Bible talk about new birth? In John's Gospel, in the third chapter, we see a mention of John's Gospel. And when, John, when Jesus talks about new birth in John's Gospel, what does he ultimately link that to? We actually read a portion of that already. The cross. So, really, what brings us to, what brings us to new birth? And really, that's, and John is a perfect place to start because, of course, um, just stepping back for a moment, when Jesus, at the beginning of John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Who else is there? Jesus and Nicodemus. Who's there? Nobody. Nobody else is there. At least as far as we know. The scripture doesn't record anybody else being there. This is just Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he had this exchange with him. And so Nicodemus says what he says and it's kind of interesting. And, and again, for those of you who like um, the King James Version, you're going to like this too. Um, he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but, and, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. Now, first of all, let's step back for a second. Now, we already heard this exchange 
You know, Jesus says to, or Nicodemus says, nobody can do the miracles that you do. And of course, Jesus really isn't responding to Nicodemus. He, he has his own thing that he's doing. And so he turns to Nicodemus and says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus obviously doesn't understand what he's saying, and he's, so he asks this ridiculous question, well, can a man enter his mother's womb again to be born? Jesus does respond to this, and he says, Well, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's not sufficient just to be born of the flesh. You must be born of the Spirit as well. But then he says this, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now modern translations would translate this, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Who is Jesus talking to? Wow, that's pretty good. Where'd you get that? <laughs> what? Ye is always plural. Exactly. Now, do you get that when you read a regular translation? If you read a, another modern translation, marvel not that I said unto to thee, you must be born again. The assumption would be he's talking to Nicodemus and Nicodemus alone. Nicodemus, you have to be born again. But he's not talking just to Nicodemus. He's saying what? All of you. Now, if you're a good youper like I am, you would say, you guys must be born again. Yes, or if you're a southerner, yeah, all y'all. Unfortunately, when you get the modern translations, it doesn't always tell you that this is a plural. We do this all the time. You can be both singular or plural, depending on how you use it. But when you read it in the scripture, it sounds like Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you have to be born again. This is why this whole thing about new birth is focused on the individual. We always focus it on the individual. But Jesus is telling Nicodemus, the problem isn't just with you, Nicodemus. The problem is with the whole race. All of you must be born again. But then he says this other thing too. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. What does that, what does that say? Don't answer right away so I can drink. Yeah. So can we ever identify exactly when someone is born of the Spirit? Yeah, you see the effects of it. But can I tell where the wind comes from? I mean... That boggles the mind anyway. Can you think about that? Okay, well, the wind's coming from the east, so if I go far enough east, I should be able to find out where it comes from. Well, probably not from the east. It's usually from the west, but anyway. The point is made. And so it remains a mystery. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not given for you to know. Of course, Nicodemus kind of goes on, and he says, well, how can... You know, how can these things be? So now, poor Nicodemus has no clue what he's talking about, and he doesn't even know what question to ask. But Jesus turns around and says, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? In other words, Nicodemus, you should know this. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, to this point, has, Nicodemus, has Jesus answered the question of Nicodemus? 
How can a man be born when he is old? Has Jesus answered the question yet? No. He hasn't answered Nicodemus' question, which is kind of a, this is a kind of a cool thing about Jesus because sometimes Jesus will listen to our question, but then he'll give an answer to a question that we didn't ask. Or he won't give us directly the, que- the answer to the question that we're asking. Instead, he gives us something better. But he does answer Nicodemus' question, but he answers it in a different way. He says, Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Of course, Nicodemus is asking the wrong question because that's not the way new birth really is. We We don't enter into our mother's womb again and be born. Nicodemus is so stuck on that idea. But he finally, Jesus finally gets around to answering the question by saying, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, for God so sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, two things about this. First of all, verse 16. Um, this is kind of a sidelight, but I'll mention it anyway. When it says, for God so loved the world, it's good for us to think of it not so much in terms of um, how much God loved the world, although that's true. God loved the world greatly. But really what John is saying, or what Jesus is saying here is, God loved the world in this way. This is the way God showed his love to the world. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved us in a great way, but he loved us in a very specific way by the sacrifice of his son. Secondly, before we ask the question, is there new birth in baptism, we should first ask the question, where does new birth come from? God. So we start there. New birth comes from God. But then how does new birth come from God to us? Okay, it's like the wind. We don't know where it comes from, where it's going. But what we can say, and Jesus does talk about it here, and we've already talked about it a little bit, it's grace that does this, right? God doesn't give us new birth because we deserve it. He gives it to us because... He loves us. He gives it to us because of the merits of Christ. And we receive it, how? By faith. God is the one who brings new birth to us. He does it by his grace. And he does it through faith. Where does faith come? From Christ by the hearing of the word. Where do we hear the word of God? We hear it proclaimed from the pulpit. We hear it in our Bible study. We hear it in our private devotion. We hear it in the sacrament of the altar. We hear it in the waters of baptism. We hear it in the absolution. Again, it's critical that we see that new birth is not separated from the word of God, but rather reinforced by it and delivered by it. There's another passage from, about new birth that talks about this, and this is kind of important too, and it's linked to that passage out of Peter. So we have to look to 1 Peter chapter 1, and then I think we'll take a break.
1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What does that mean, begotten us again? Yep. Same thing. To be begotten means to be born. So where, does new, where is new birth found? According to Peter? What's that? Yeah, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And does, that, does Peter say this is just for you individually? No, because he says he has begotten you? No, us. He has begotten us. He has brought new birth to the race by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now look a little bit farther on in chapter 1. Um, let's look to verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth for the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another from, with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So he uses that phrase again. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By what? The word of God. So, we probably haven't really addressed the question yet. Why, don't you have a limit of one? <laughs> no, that's okay. We'll, we'll get to it. But let me say one more thing about it before we move on. So again, we don't separate new birth from the word. Now, where the problem comes in is when the individual thing comes in. And this is where one of those misunderstandings of baptism comes in because you, you've probably heard it said that you Lutherans say that, well, that child, when he was baptized, the day before he was baptized, he was not, he did not have new birth. Or the other objection is, well, if you say that baptism, there's new birth in baptism, that means there's no repentance and no faith needed. But neither one of those things is true. First of all, who can tell if a child believes before they're baptized? Do I have the capacity to say that? Now, unfortunately, I do know Lutheran pastors, well-meaning enough, who do a baptism and they say, today this child becomes a child of God. And it sounds great, except if you think it through and say, Wait a minute, if you say today this child becomes a child of God, what if this child didn't make it to today? Now, they don't mean it that way. They don't mean to introduce that question. But invariably, someone's going to ask the question. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, because what do we know about what Christ has done? He has brought new birth to the human race. We baptize them because they are children of God. That's okay. I am saying. Well, are we all born in sin? Okay, so that's original sin. So we've discussed it. We did discuss it actually once. We read out of, out of Romans 5, right? 
Adam, because of Adam? Yep. So everyone was born a sinner. But also, if you remember verse 18 in that passage, out of Romans 5, this is what it says. We have to go back to, what is it, page 2. No. Yeah, top of page 2. Verse 18. Therefore, by, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. All meaning how many? Everyone. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men. How many? All. Came upon all men unto justification of life. So let's go back for a second. The offense, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. So when did you become a sinner? Yeah, even before then, right? David says, I was conceived in sin. You know? So we were sinners from the moment of conception. But Paul also says that even though you were born a sinner, you were also born what? Justified. What does that mean again? That as you stand before God, because of the merits of Christ, you are what? You're justified. Because, what that? Not because you were born. You're justified because of Christ. I'm just using that as a time thing. You know, because if we want to say, well, when exactly were we sinners? Well, it wasn't because when we committed our first sin, we were conceived in sin. So when were we justified? And actually, this is more of a, even a deeper theological question. When did God justify us? Yeah, when he suffered and died on the cross. And actually, when did he do that? What? Okay, when he rose from the dead. Okay, let me throw another curveball at you. This will really blow your mind. Again, in 1 Peter. Because we know when that happened. We, we would say, well, okay, this is when Jesus died and rose again. That was the big thing. What does Peter say about that event? Again, this is 1 Peter chapter 1. Okay, okay, so let's start off with verse 18. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested at these last times for you. When did God choose to love you? When did God choose to save you? When did God choose to make you righteous? Before you were ever formed, before Adam and Eve were even here, before there was any sin in the world, God already knew what he had to do. Now, this is the problem because, of course, God is not bound by time and space like we are. We're so fixed on time and space that it's really hard for us to comprehend something like this. That's why it kind of blows your mind when you think, you mean God knew everything in such a way that he already planned for Jesus to suffer and die on a cross even before the world came into existence? It blows our mind because we don't have the mind of God. But this is what Peter's done. This is why it's so hard to answer the question, you know, when is someone born again? They do. The best answer I've ever heard to that question was, this was a guy I talked to many years ago. He was 
singing in a Christian band. And uh, he was a Lutheran. And there was something about his presentation that always struck me because I thought, this guy's different than some of the other Christians I've heard in bands. Most of these Christian bands are people from maybe a Reformed background or a Baptist background or something like that. But these guys were different. So I went and talked to them. I said, what church background were you? And they said, well, we were Lutherans. And I said, Lutherans? I've never heard of a band with, with Lutherans in them. And he said, yeah, we're the only ones we know of, too. <laughs> so, I, so I got to talking about with him, and I said, you know, what's, that's got to be kind of challenging for you to go through some of these events. One of the things that we went through at this particular event, it was a youth event, and they had an altar call associated with it. And when I brought my kids there, I was always kind of wondering, should I even bring them? Because I don't want them coming to the idea that going to the altar call makes you a Christian somehow. Because that's kind of the way it's pressured on you. If you really wanted to ask Jesus in your heart, this is the time to do it. And so there's enormous peer pressure on these kids to come forward because they see a couple other kids go and they feel they got to go. And so I try to tell them, and I tell them in advance, I said, what is it that makes you a Christian? And hopefully they get around to answering the right question. I believe in Jesus. Is going forward at the altar call, is that going to make you a Christian? Is it going to make you a better Christian? And they say, well, no. I say, good. Okay, that's good. That's all I want to know. If you want to go forward and have them pray with you, that's fine. If you want to go forward thinking that I wasn't a Christian before, but now I will because I came forward, then you've just said, well, what Jesus did for me on the cross wasn't quite enough took me walking forward to do it. So anyway, I told him that. And so I, that's when I asked, yeah, question? Okay, well, let's, well, let me finish the story first. So I asked this guy, I said, don't you have problems with some of this stuff? And he says, well, yeah, we, we struggle with it a little bit. He says, the biggest struggle I have is when all these people come up to us all the time and they say, when were you born again? And they want to hear our story. They, they want to hear something about when, either maybe when we had came to faith or when we had a spiritual experience, something like that. They want to hear something dramatic like that. And so we finally got around to giving the answer. And the answer was this. I was born again 2,000 years ago on a hill outside of Jerusalem in, on a Friday afternoon at Calvary's Cross. I'm telling you, when he said that, I literally had goosebumps going on my arm. I thought that was the best answer I'd ever heard. That was so good. Because now, my confidence is not in the fact that I walked up. Or my confidence is not even in the experience that I've had of God, as good as that might be. My confidence is on Calvary's cross. So, anyway. Really? I know it has. Yeah. That was before I was on the central board. <laughs> I'll dodge it. <laughs> you can't hold me responsible for it. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look at it. I don't remember that phrase in the doctrine. Now, I will say, too, by the way, that's not an approved position in our church. That's not an official document that was never agreed upon by the pastors in our federation. It was never agreed upon by the delegates of our federation. So it's not an official document. I know it was put out, and maybe it, it's conveyed that way, 
it, but it was never agreed upon. So um, I know there are people that refer to it as saying that that was a founding document, but it was never that. Was oh, I know it was. Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Well, and see, that's the interesting thing, because the answer really is yes and no. Right? Because if, where is new birth found? In Christ, how is it revealed to us? How is it brought to us? Through the Word. So, is there new birth in the Word? I would say yes. I think the Scripture bears that out. So, when, where is the Word present? Now, I know that's not answering the question the way some people want it answered because they want to know: Is that child? Was that child? born again at the baptismal font. And they, I, do, I agree. I think that's a great answer. I think, I think that's a great answer. But am I going to confine it to that? Could, is it possible they could have been born again before that? And of course, I would still argue their rebirth took place at Calvary. Now, my experience is un another thing. And this is this is where this becomes a little bit difficult because I'm, I might come to a conscious awareness of this later on in life. That's why I think so many of our people have focused on confession and absolution. Because who remembers their baptism? I don't remember my baptism. I don't remember what happened the day before my baptism. I don't remember if I was any different after my baptism. All I know is I got a certificate saying I was baptized. You know? But I do remember various times in my life where God really impressed upon me his great love and my great depth of sin and how much I needed his son. But is that my birth, my new birth? I, and I wouldn't necessarily say it was. But I would say, it w was it important for me? Yeah, I think it is important for all of us to have some, time, some point in our life where we recognize in a deeper way our need for Savior. And the reason I say that is because of what Simeon is told, what tell, Simeon tells Mary. You remember this passage where, where Jesus goes to the temple, uh, I mean where Joseph and Mary go to the temple to present Jesus, and Simeon is there. Simeon sees the Christ child. He knows instantly that this is the Messiah. And he lifts him up in his arms, and he says, Lord, now you can let me die according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. One of the most beautiful stories. I just love that story. I, I just can't imagine what Mary and Joseph were thinking. They witnessed this. He's ready to die now because he's seen the Messiah. The Messiah is just a baby. But already Simeon knows. But then he also addresses Mary and he says, a sword will pierce through your soul also. And a lot of people have said that that means Mary's going to have to watch her son die on a cross, and that's going to be hard. And I'm not saying that's not part of it. But I think the deeper part is Mary needs a Savior, too. She's given birth to the Savior, but that's not going to save her. The Savior will save her. Her son will save her. So she's going to have to come to, to a point where she recognizes that she needs a Savior. Now, when does that happen? I have no idea. And I don't think the scripture tells us. I think that's the wind. Mm hmm.
Exactly. And that and that's the problem because you know, I appreciate you saying that, Scott, because I've seen that too, and that was exactly what those those guys I was talking about experienced because they wanted to know the day and the hour and the place and all that kind of stuff. And I've heard of people who actually make a sign and they put it in their yard and say, you know, on this date at this time this happened. And the danger of that is not so much that we ignore our our, our experience of God. But the danger is now my focus is not is is on this sign, on this date, this time, and this date instead of what. The cross. If I put all my confidence in this sign, all this event. The problem is the devil can use that, you know. Because what will the devil do? You had that experience, and the devil's going to come back and say, "Did you really feel that way?" Is that really true? Did you really receive the Spirit that day? Were you really born again that day? But what the devil can never do is he can never take away the, the, the fixed event of the cross. He can't do it. It's there. And if our confidence is there, that's what matters. And again, it's not like, you know, every one of us has had our own experience of God in some way or another and it's all good for us but my experience of God is not more important than what Christ did at the cross it can't be I don't Yeah, and let me... Yeah, I, I think... Well, I, yeah, I think it's most often referred to as a piercing of the heart, but I, I'd like to think of it that way more so than the other. Um, but we need to take a break, but I want to address just a couple of things because if we're going to shift to the other subject, I want to cover a couple of other things. And this is more leaning towards a misunderstanding of baptism because there's probably some questions still uh, unanswered. And one of them is usually the way some people address baptism is they say, well, we don't like this Lutheran way of understanding baptism because it comes without repentance and faith. But as we've talked about already, of course that's not true. Because baptisms are always done with the word of God. And what does the word of God bring with it? It engenders or brings repentance and faith. By its very definition, by this performative utterance, the word of God does something. It always does. Whether, it, whether we change because of it, that's different. But it's always doing something. It won't let us alone. The other part of this, too, and you hear this a lot, is, oh, you, you Lutherans, you just say baptize them and let them go. <laughs> no. Nobody ever says that. This is always an exaggeration because even, well, when in the altar book, what do we tell our people? What do we tell parents after their child is baptized? Absolutely. And is repentance necessary after baptism? Absolutely. 
Does, does Luther talk about that in the Catechism? Yeah. He says to die what? Daily. You know, that we do, we die daily. And that's probably underestimated, right? Do we have to die more than once daily? Probably. But the point isn't so much daily as continually. We need to, you know, you know what the first, you've heard about the 95 theses that Luther nailed to the door in Wittenberg. Do you know what the first one is? The life of a Christian should be one of daily repentance. That's the first one. The life of a Christian should be one of daily repentance. That's pretty good. I, I have to admit, I wish I would have known that earlier, you know, because you'd think, well, you know, we're supposed to be Lutherans, we should know kind of this stuff, but I didn't know this until much later. But it's pretty good. Um, the other thing, you know, that people hear all, we hear all the, all the time is that, oh, yeah, if you're saying if you're saying that there's any new birth in baptism, if you're saying anything like that, that you're basically telling people that unbaptized children are condemned to hell. And this is flat out wrong. There is no Lutheran teaching on that whatsoever. Now, to be fair, there is someone who did say that. And unfortunately, it was one of the esteemed church fathers, St. Augustine. But we need to understand something historically about this because people were refusing to have their children baptized. And so Augustine went a little too far and he says, you don't realize that if you don't baptize your children, they're, they're going to be condemned. So he was addressing an abuse or a faulty understanding of baptism. But in doing so, then he introduced <laughs> something that was bad too. And we don't agree with him. Nobody has ever said Augustine was right about that. He was right about a lot of things. He was wrong about that. Because we certainly don't. Because the scripture doesn't testify to that, right? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But does it say he that believeth not shall be condemned? Yes. Does it say he that is ba not baptized shall be condemned? No. And so we would always say, it is not the lack of baptism, but rather what? The despising of it. If I despise baptism, that means I'm despising the command of God. I'm despising the blessings that are clearly presented in the word. And I'm saying, I don't care what you say, God. I'm not getting baptized, and I'm not baptizing my children. Those words aren't spoken of in faith. If we say such things, that's dangerous ground. So it's not the lack of baptism. You know, and, and we go to the thief on the cross. You know, the thief on the cross, you know, was he baptized? This is always a thing that people throw at Lutherans. They say, well, yeah, you know, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. But we never said that it was absolutely necessary. This is, again, one of those things. Baptism is necessary, but it's not absolutely necessary. Gotta make put your kids in what? Mm-hmm. Well, except for one thing for sure. You know, where you're you lost children it was as a stillborn or oh they were three years old were they under the hearing of the word yeah does the word bring forth new birth or not Yeah. 
But David was hardly innocent. <laughs> right, he, that's true. But we'll, we'll continue that in a second. Question over here. Yeah, I think the reason they bring it up is because, well, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, as far as we know, the thief was never baptized. So, well, fair enough. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, and that's, that's kind of the, that's the problem with these arguments because you're so fixed on one, you're trying to look for, exam, or so for exceptions to the rule and trying to make something out of the exception instead of recognizing that you know the bible the bible t stresses the importance of baptism but it really what is the only thing that keeps you out of heaven unbelief it's not unbaptism or lack of baptism it's not the lack of of the sacrament but it doesn't mean we should forsake baptism it doesn't mean we should forsake coming to the sacrament or the hearing of the word or confession and absolution in fact, it's just the opposite because these strengthen us in faith because the word is present. That's why I, I just love baptisms because every time I do this, I get to hear the word of God and I can remember that, yes, I too was baptized. And this is kind of what Luther, and this is a controversial statement of Luther's. Luther would say something like this and, and this is why people get upset with Luther. He says, when the devil comes and tempts me, he turns around and says, I am baptized. And so people get mad at that, and they say, well, why didn't he say something like, well, Jesus died on the cross for me. But what they don't realize is when, Jesus, when Luther says, I am baptized, he didn't say, I was baptized. He says, I am baptized, which means I am united with Christ. I am united with his death and resurrection. You have no place here, Satan. I am a child of the living God. And you have no authority over me. But again, we misconstrue what Luther says and we say, well, he's just saying that that event that took place. But he doesn't say, I was baptized. He says, I am baptized. I am united with Christ. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's why we don't sit and argue with Baptists about modes of baptism either, whether it's immersion or sprinkling or dipping or whatever the case we don't care about the amount of water the Bible never specifies the amount of water <laughs> you didn't need the whole sea That's true. So anyway, let's let's call it there. Let's take a little break, and we're going to have to do the other session really short. But um, but thank you very much. Let's take about a ten minute break. We'll reconvene at three thirty, and I'll do a, I'll speak twice as fast for the next one.